have the pleasure of introducing the keynote. Um, so, uh, Professor Wee Tiong Si um, is the Associate Professor in Mathematics at the Melbourne Graduate School of Education. He has an extensive experience in mathematics teaching and pastoral care across a range of school settings in Singapore and Australia. Wee Tiong's research and professional interests focus on socio-cultural, cognitive and affective aspects of learning and the roles and opportunities of artificial intelligence in mathematics education. He coordinates a multinational research team in a series of studies relating to the harnessing of values to promote more effective teaching and learning of mathematics in schools. These activities are all part of the third wave research project. In 2018, Wee Tiong was an invited speaker to some 800 principals and school leaders at last year's regional leadership conference and a plenary panelist at the Psychology and Mathematics Education Conference. So I'd like to welcome um, Wee Tiong now to um, present his keynote. Thank you, Kate. Um, now, I, I think some of you might um, have been rewarded for being here early enough to take part in this Wordle. Um, it is also a, a, a good means for us to, um, to get a sense of the sort of things, the sort of issues that uh, might uh, be uh, experienced by us. Um, but also for me to make sure that this works and because you are going to be involved in quite a few activities um, th throughout the next 45 minutes or so. So um, now if you're interested, what I'll do and what I do normally is that after the session, I will um, uh, print out uh, or save these as PDF copies and that will be made available to anyone who is interested um, so that you can have a sense of um, what your colleagues are concerned about, what are the major issues uh, that your colleagues may be uh, interested in as well. Not just for this one, but also for the next few slides. Um, so thanks, Kate, for the introduction. Um, now I will start by acknowledging um, the, the fact that, that we are living uh, for, uh, in, a, uh, in, in the coffee capital of Australia. Now, there are cafes and cafes and cafes, and I'm, I'm sure that if it had not been so wet this morning, more of us would be, um, you know, um, be visiting the cafes before dropping into, into MGSC. And, and this is one of the reasons why um, this is such a great place to, to work in and to study and, and everything else. Now, there are cafes and cafes and cafes, and I know that each and every one of us um, uh, well, most of us drink coffee, but I, I'm sure some of us uh, drink tea or, or something else. I'm sure that um, you may have in mind some favorite place to go to, yeah? And I'm sure, just like restaurants, just like anything else, your favorite cafe may not be the favorite cafe because they serve the best coffee. Although sometimes that is the main reason. Um, sometimes cafes are in your top five or top three, because of something else, the other factor, the other factor that greets you when you walk into a place. Now, my favorite kind of coffee place is this, this one here, and I'm not going to advertise for them by saying what it is. Um, it's not easy to find this place either. Uh, as you can see, it's actually a, a hole in the wall. Um, but for, for my colleagues, they know this is my happy place. And it is my happy place not because it serves good coffee, but because of something else. There's this something, this X factor that is in this place that the moment I step in through that door that says standing room only, I feel happy. They seem to serve happiness. And, and that is the, the, the sort of, I would say, the culture, um, that I, the sort of atmosphere that I, I feel when I walk into, or whenever I walk into, into this shop. Uh, as you can see, really, literally, it's a, it's a hole in the wall. Um, there's no address, there is no um, shop name, but um, um, people seem to know about it. Even though it is surrounded by many, many coffee, coffee shops within 50 meters of its, um, of its location. So, um, so that, is, that is what got me to, to, to think about what I would like to focus on today. Um, and I just want to also um, you know, mention that I, as I talk about the sort of X factor, the sort of atmosphere in your classroom, in a mass classroom or in your school, um, I'm reminded by Thomas Sergiovanni's uh, uh, one of those things that he actually said um, uh, when he was um, still uh, alive. Um, one of the things that uh, actually um, was very deeply en ingrained in my mind was what he would say that as leaders in schools, it is better to be managerially loose and culturally tight than to be managerially tight 
and culturally loose. I'll leave you to ponder over what this means over the next five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, done. Um, but you, you will notice that Thomas is um, uh, work and his beliefs and his vision about leadership in schools uh, is very much influencing um, the uh, leadership framework that um, the department um, uh, has put out. So uh, this is the developmental learning framework for school leaders. Uh, I'm sure this is not new to, um, to you all. Um, five components there and for today I would like to focus on just the um, cultural leadership. The cultural leadership component, and that was why I started to talk about um, the coffee shops. And cultural leadership is really about when you are a leader, the sort of this aspect of cultural leadership, this aspect of leadership that you take care of, that you, you, um, that you uh, ensure that is uh, thriving in your workplace. And you, as a leader, you will, through cultural leadership, demonstrate an understanding of the characteristics of what makes your school what makes your maths department, what makes your group of maths teachers effective and a capacity to lead your school community and your maths colleagues in promoting a vision of the future. And the future and the vision can be of maths and numeracy learning, uh, underpinned by common purposes and values that will secure the commitment and alignment of stakeholders to realize the potential of all learners. And I would uh, also like to just um, highlight the three capabilities that are subsumed under cultural leadership. And these three uh, components, shaping the future with a vision, developing a unique school culture with common goals, common beliefs, common values, as well as the sustaining of partnerships and networks. These are the three components that will form the, the framework of what I will be talking about in the next 39 seconds, uh, 39 minutes or so. Um, so um, so now, so therefore, the point I'm trying to say is that the leadership framework is not new to, to you all, especially if you are principal or vice principal. Um, it's useful for many aspects of uh, leadership in schools. But I just want to, to play with the idea today of also extending that to mass leadership. And of course, we can extend that to the leadership of any other uh, subject areas as well. So that's where I'm coming, coming from today. Um, so, cultural leadership in, in education. Now, if you look at the three components, a vision for the future, common purposes and values, and commitment and alignment and buying in of stakeholders, when we extend to mass education, it, it can be rephrased uh, in the following manner. Creating a vision for mass education in your workplace. Identifying those values, those common purposes as they relate to your vision for mass education in your workplace, and some ways of achieving this with the parents, with the learners, with um, your colleagues, with your uh, colleagues in the school network, and with other people in the community as well. So, so you can see uh, parallels and, and ways in which that can be made uh, in a parallel manner. Now, visions for school mass is not new. I mean, it's, it's not something that, um, that we are thinking about only today. NCTM uh, is very good at churning out visions uh, for school maths uh, every 10 years or so. Um, and, um, now, and, and that's important because you, you do notice whenever NCTM churns out something, five years later, it comes here, more or less, in one form or another. Uh, and and it's the sort of effect that it has. Now, this is NCTM's vision for maths education. Uh, I'm sure you probably would have read it before, um, but it's um, also readily available on the net. Uh, of course, I, I will make all these slides uh, freely available for all um, um, via the MAV. Um, and I just I don't want to pretend the vision for maths and vision for maths education is uh, only unique to NCTM. Uh, there are people writing about it, there are people researching it. Uh, you, you read it in, in education journals, you read it in any um, sort of teacher uh, magazines as well. But vision need not be as lengthy as the NCTMs. Um, look at uh, what this needs uh, vision. It's a very simple one. To make people happy, and I think in some variations, they say that their vision is to make people, especially children, happy. So short and sharp, but it captures the vision and the direction of what they want to do. Um, IKEA um, has a vision that is also very simple, very neat, 
to create a better everyday life for the many people. And you can see that uh, being uh, uh, mentioned, being um, uh, put out in public, uh, not just in IKEA stores, but also in the, in the um, um, literature as well. So may I ask, may I ask ourselves, what is your vision for maths or numeracy education in your school or centre? Now, this is a, a means whereby over the next few minutes, feel free to contribute your ideas. But as Jim, my, my boss, was saying just now, this is not just about you contributing your ideas and giving yourself a chance to think about the vision that you have for your school, but it's also a means whereby you can get a sense of what the people sitting around you are thinking about, the visions that they have as well. So it's a bit of a um, learning experience, a bit of referencing um, that you may be doing or uh, uh, involving yourself in the next two or three minutes. So feel free to contribute your ideas through either the URL or through your um, mobile phone SMS uh, text messages. So s something short and sharp will be, will be good. And you start to see some words appearing multiple times, um, which is quite different from the first um, slide that you started off today. Um, collaboration, confidence. I think I see the word growth at least twice so far. Growth mindset. OK, so we'll just leave this on for the next few seconds. And for those of you who have um, uh, already contributed, um, just feel free to have a, have a look at what your colleagues are saying as well. Now, when I progress to the next slide, you can still continue to um, um, contribute. So uh, not to worry about it. Um, so I've started uh, you off thinking about what your vision might be for maths and numeracy education in your school or with a group of teachers or in a centre. Um, and having that vision is good because that vision tells you where you want to go. The vision tells you where you want your school, uh, no pun intended, you want your school or your centre to go. However, to reach the destination, very often, we need to be guided by a set of qualities, a set of uh, 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 attributes that you will find important for yourself and for your colleagues to subscribe to, to follow. So, so that's where the second dot point becomes crucial. Having the vision is one thing, but to reach that destination, what are the common purposes? What are the common values? What are the common beliefs that you would want to cultivate, to inculcate, uh, and to, uh, to shape uh, as you move towards that goal, towards that vision, together with your colleagues? And so what are these common purposes and values? Um, and sometimes the interaction between vision and values is um, quite a tricky one. Uh, for those of you who are old enough to know about Levi's jeans, because I don't think they are, on, they are that popular these days. Uh, now, Levi's is, of course, uh, one of the, uh, at, at the time, and it's, and it's very, um, I think it would be in the 1970s and 80s, very popular. It was the, like the hallmark, the, the Lexus of jeans. Um, and everybody, when I was a teenager, everybody wanted to buy a pair of Levi's jeans. Um, they have their own company vision. I mean, as a multinational company with factories all around the world, they have the company uh, vision statements, mission statements, and so on and so forth. Um, one of the beliefs, one of the visions that they subscribe to is that the use of child labor is not permissible. And of course, this is one of those ideas that are subscribed to by most, if not all, uh, corporations. What happened was that in the 1970s, they found that one of the factories uh, in a particular uh, continent was employing children that are below 15 years of age. Now, what was the response of the leadership team in Levi's? Um, the simple answer, of course, is for them to shut down that branch or that factory 
or to fire um, 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 the people involved, or to 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 get in a way to um, to get rid of all the children or the child labor. But they did not do that because they are aware that for the amount of money that those children were earning in those sweatshops, in those factories, that amount of money might be enough, might be crucial for the respective families that the children come from. It could be the lifeline. These children might be supporting their own families. So Levi's was able to actually say that let's look back at our corporate values. What do we believe in? We believe in empathy. We believe in originality. We believe in integrity. We believe in courage. And as a company, they took the courage to make a decision, which is that, yes, we do not tolerate child labor. Okay, but that's a vision. However, the, our values are guiding us to do what we should be doing. And what they did in response to that phenomenon or to the incident was that while they say that the children cannot come to the factories to work anymore, we acknowledge that you need, the, you need the money and the money is important. We will send you to school. We will pay you for the school fees. We will pay you the salary that we used to be paying you, but we don't want you to come into the factories to work. That's what they did. Now, there is a small amount of investment, but for a company, but for a community, that means a lot. So this is an example of how vision and common values, core values, corporate values, and of course, in this case, in our case, school values, um, interact. And so, therefore, when we talk about school values, I mean, we all know that nearly every school has its own set of values. Um, just a quick Google search of school values will reveal um, many. You know, I, 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 I just had to create in yesterday school values, and um, you see what uh, comes out in the top uh, few, and, and, and of course, for the next 20, 30 um, uh, items as well. Uh, so we, we do have our own set of values. So these are some quick examples uh, of a school. They have the four, four R's as the values. So this school values relationships. This school values respect. This school as a community, as a school community, uh, as a learning organization, values resilience, and it also values responsibility. And you see this in documents, you see this in websites, uh, and also you see this in school, along school corridors as well. So this is another school uh, which re um, values uh, attributes like respect, responsibility, perseverance, kindness, tolerance, so on and so forth, uh, whatever's behind. Now, one of the things that we discovered in the, uh, in the early 2000s when we went around schools was asking teachers um, at the time, how well do you activate, how well do you um, articulate the teaching of these values, these school values, or in, in the sense, in some schools, religious values uh, in your school maths curriculum? How well does that translate? How do you teach responsibility through the teaching of maths? How do you cultivate perseverance through the teaching of maths and numeracy? And there is a lot of opportunities, perseverance and maths. I mean, very often we say, hey, come on, you just have to persevere. But you know, we know that children give up. Sometimes they give up. And this is a perfect opportunity for children, for the young learners, for the young citizens to learn the value of having the grit, persevering through something that's difficult for them. So, so that's one thing where um, I think there's a lot of um, opportunities in, in maths and numeracy uh, for the school values to be inculcated. But of course, as you saw just now in the, uh, in the website, there was this entry of the Australian um, school values, values for Australian schooling. Um, so this is the, the, the set of nine, uh, which was um, uh, uh, encapsulated in the um, Howard government, by the Howard government in the late 1990s. Um, and it was um, produced in the form of a purple poster. And I think for those of you who are old enough, uh, those were the days when I think we were actually uh, reminded that this poster has to be displayed in a public enough area if you want to get your funding and, and that sort of thing. Yeah? And I think in, in some, some schools today, I still see that poster being displayed. Um, uh, how well, how well do you think that this set of nine values represent the values for Australian schooling? How well do you think that they reflect the Australian society and community? So again, um, those are the kinds of things that, um, that uh, would be good for, 
you and your colleagues, for you and your teachers to discuss, uh, to contemplate, and how they might be translated into maths education as well. So, so what's important for you? So, you know, we know we have a vision for maths education. What's important for you in the teaching and learning of maths? How important for you are the four maths proficiencies? Understanding, problem solving, fluency, and reasoning. For me, they are the four values. They are the four basic values that underpin uh, maths and numeracy learning um, in, our, in our schools today. Um, how well do, or are they built into your colleagues' curriculum or your curriculum and your teaching uh, in the day-to-day -day, uh, introductions or, and sharing of mathematical knowledge? And of course, there are other kinds of things that you think is important as well. Collaboration. To what extent is collaboration amongst children important? And how do you breathe that? How do you make that alive? through the sort of activities that you introduce to the children, through the sort of planning that you have for your, your grade, for, for the maths um, learning that will take, take place in the following weeks or so. Uh, we often associate logical thinking and rationalism with maths. So how well do we cultivate that uh, in your maths classroom? What is the atmosphere? What is the X factor of your maths classroom look like? What does it look like? Does it have this atmosphere where children thrive, children enjoy collaborating with each other, where your learners enjoy being challenged by logical thinking exercises uh, or logical thinking challenges? Um, efficiency. So, so these are some examples. And of course, there are many more examples that we can talk about. Um, but I think it's important to be able to identify for yourselves for your group, for your maths teachers, what is important um, if we want the learners to enjoy and to be effective in learning maths well or, or numeracy well? And of course, there are many, many different ways of um, identifying those values. Um, there are questionnaires. Um, there are questionnaires like the, um, the one that we use with uh, different countries. Now, this is available in eight different languages. But I don't think for a moment that this will be useful for schools because this will take time uh, and this, is, uh, this will take, uh, in a way, some uh, expertise in making sense of what the questionnaire is saying to, to you. Um, and I tend to, when I talk to, to school teachers, I tend to say that um, let's, let's, let's identify the sort of things that we value through self-reflection exercises, through opportunities for us as principals or VPs or mass teachers or mass leaders um, to actually self-reflect on what we believe in and then identify the values from there. Now, one way of doing this is to make use of the wide control level survey. Um, this um, first started off, was first started off in the, uh, in the industries. Um, Toyota Corporation is one of those um, that make use of this very, very efficiently uh, with their employees in identifying the problem and the root cause of, um, of problems uh, uh, that they, they encounter. So um, this has been um, transported or in incorporated into the education circle uh, in the last 20 years or so. Now, this is the very simple exercise. And what you need to do, basically, is to keep asking yourself, why, 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 why? And I'm sure for those of you, you know, your girlfriends or your boyfriends or your husbands and wife would have asked you that anyway, every day. Why, do you, why are you late for work? Or why are you late, for, why are you late home? Why are you not feeding our dog? And, and why are you not bringing our dog for a walk? So the, the levels of why will help you to identify what exactly is at the center of your heart. So let's say, say we normally begin with an activity. We normally begin with something that you do in your classroom, or you want, or you observe someone doing in the classroom. So for example, as an example, you start with an activity, or a task, or a phenomenon. So I would say, uh, in this case, the use of this app called Explain Everything. Yeah? Now, I'm not advertising for this app. There are many e equivalent apps. Uh, I think you can buy this for $1.99 from the Apple Store, but there are ma many more uh, show and tell apps. Uh, it's just that I, I, I like, I, I've been using this app quite a bit now. So if I ask myself, why do I use this app? I mean, I'm not a fan of Apple. In fact, I'm super anti Apple. <laughs> the reason why that laptop is Apple is because it was given to me. I mean, you know, but otherwise, but I, I've trained to, to uh, anyway, so that's the other thing altogether. <laughs> Um, so why? And I keep asking myself, and the reason I'm, I might say is, oh, because I want to introduce ICT to my students. Now, there's no right or wrong answer. You may have another reason for using uh, uh, Explain Everything app. 
Oh, yeah? So for me, it's the you know, ICT. And I ask myself again, why ICT? Why is ICT important for me? So if you keep asking yourself those levels of question, why is this thing important to you professionally? You will get at the root thing, the root cause, or the thing that you value most. Oh, for me, um, ICT is important because it is about efficiency. It is about getting the children, getting the learners to be efficient when they do maths. But again, for you, um, ICT is important maybe for another reason. Um, it could be because of visualization. ICT is important for me because it helps my learners to visualize um, the geometrical properties better, so on and so forth. So there may be other reasons, and that's okay. But that will help you to identify what exactly, as a school uh, leader or as a math leader, actually values, and how those might transform itself uh, in the sort of practices that you do uh, in a math classroom. So this is one example uh, through self-reflection uh, you can engage in. Now, another sort of uh, example where you can actually make use of uh, quite easily to try to identify the sort of things that you value as a teacher, as a professional, as a leader, is this repertory grid technique um, that was introduced by the American George Kelly in the 1950s. Um, um, it is now um, quite heavily used as well in educational research. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm not going to go through, I mean, I, I, I run workshops on how, how this is done. Um, but um, if you just Google, and I think there, were, there are some YouTube videos where you can watch as well to, to get a sense of how this, is, uh, how this can be used. Um, but it's a very, very useful technique of identifying values. And I put there self-reflection stroke interview because it is also very useful in the sense that if you don't want to do this yourself, you can do this with a boss. You can do this with a colleague. So you can actually interview each other. And sometimes it's quite efficient that way. So I, I could be working with Kate, and then together we explore what we together value in our maths learning or maths teaching uh, 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 set of beliefs. So, so this is the, um, uh, uh, something that I would recommend that you, you explore as well. Uh, some of our PhD students are also using this as a means of collecting and analyzing data. So it's quite useful. Um, now, I would, I would have done this if I have time. If I have another hour, I would have done this with you all. Um, my ideal city, so as a way of demonstrating how we can use the repertory grid technique uh, to identify values. So, yes, so therefore, identifying values is important. Um, what's the next step? So we have, remember we have three things to, to look at today. The identification of the our vision, the identification of a common set of beliefs and values um, that will complement the vision, and the third one will be creating the culture to buy in, to create a culture whereby your colleagues, your stakeholders will go and travel with you. And that's important, creating a culture. So let's look at an example of, uh, of a situation where the culture was missing. Um, Wells Fargo is, um, is, is, a, um, is, is a brand name that you would certainly encounter when you go to Trumpland, uh, I mean USA. Um, it's a national bank in, in the US. The very long value statements includes, just like NCTM, very long vision statements. Uh, and it includes, we want our customers to trust us as the financial resource, so on and so forth. But what happens was that in um, a few years ago, uh, just two or three years ago, um, they were found to be involved, or, or the employees were found to be involved in quite extensive uh, incidents of fraud. Uh, and uh, uh, customers were put into unwanted accounts or charged unnecessary fees. Sounds familiar? I don't think it's happening only in the US. But anyway, um, so what was missing? What was missing at Wells Fargo? So, um, so therefore, um, this is a good example whereby what happened was that while well, we, have, we have those vision statements out there in the documents and in the websites and all that, but at the ground level, and in your case, at the classroom level, the employees were pushed to achieve KPIs that are in the form of how much money are you bringing in through your customers, so on and so forth. So those unrealistic KPIs are actually pushing the employees to engage in, um, I would say, uh, not uh, unethical uh, behavior. So, so that is important. And, and I'm sure you can see the parallel and the need 
for that happening in your workplace as well in schools. So having the culture that reflects the vision is important. Having the culture where you bring with you um, your stakeholders, your learners, your parents, your boss, uh, so on and so forth is also important. Um, how am I doing with time, Kate? Yep, okay. So, I, so um, how do we go about doing that? Um, now, I will, there are many ways, of course, of creating the culture. Um, so I will just simply uh, mention three, uh, which are, um, I, I believe quite dearly to my heart. Um, now, of course, the picture that you see on the right-hand side uh, is a set of values that the Department of, uh, uh, of uh, Education and Training uh, in Victoria uh, subscribes to. And I include that because that is an example of how the values, the culture is inculcated through the use of symbols. The use of banners and positioning these banners is an example of how symbols can be used to remind your stakeholders, to remind your learners, your colleagues of the things that are important for you. So what you, school, you saw just now in the, in the earlier slide where the, the, the school was having all those values being hung along the walkway and corridor is another example of how symbols can be put to very effective use as well. So don't undervalue uh, them. In fact, uh, our department actually uh, even wrapped their pillars uh, with these uh, banners of these, of these values. So um, there, there are those uh, um, seven values and I think there were exactly seven pillars. Just, just go to Spring Street and have a look. And each of those pillars are wrapped in one banner representing each value. So you can see how important those symbols are, greeting the, 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 the visitor as you walk into the headquarters. Ceremonies. Now, one of the ways in which we can actually make use of ceremonies to remind our learners about the sort of things that hold dear to us is to, you know, of course, in a mass situation, very commonly in schools, um, is to have, um, to celebrate uh, events like Pi Day. I'm sure it's not new to you all, yeah? Now, my criticism of pie day is the following. So what? At the end of it all, you eat the pies, you talk about pie. So what? How many of us actually use the opportunity to talk about the significance of pie? It is such an important day that um, in the US, it's now a national day. It's a national pie day in the US. Yeah, but um, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm really not sure to what extent, um, other than having all those photographs taken of very nice pies with pie uh, on it, um, um, how, how do students recognize or associate this value with geometry? Do children walk away thinking that, oh, pie ends with 5359? Five, so making use of those ceremonies to actually talk about maths is important. Making use of those ceremonies and events to bring the maths alive is important. And to make use of those ceremonies to talk about the applicationality, oh, no such word, to talk about how maths is applicational is important. But let's be, let's be real, okay, telling them that quality equations is important because um, the Sydney Harbour Bridge represents the parabola curve. To me, I mean, so what? I'm not going to be an engineer designing a bridge in the future. Uh, I'll simply pay the state government a toll to use the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Uh, it's where I uh, propose to my girlfriend on New Year's Eve or whatever year. I mean, that's the significance of Sydney Harbour Bridge to me. Whether it's a parabola or whether it is or any other shape doesn't mean anything to me. So, so I mean, let's be real about applicational aspects of maths. Maths is terribly applicational, but we have to make that application real to them. I think somebody mentioned recently about, oh, why do we need to, to learn the multiplication of fractions? I mean, do you use that in your daily life? We don't. But I think we have to be, to, to be true to ourselves to actually say to the students that the multiplication of fractions is important to learn because it is applicational. Yes, it is applicational, but it is not applicational because you're going to use it when you do your cooking or whatever. But it is applicational perhaps because it teaches us. It is the, um, I mean, there are many possible answers to that. Uh, it is applicational because it is the basis of algebraic thinking. 
It is a basis for you to be able to involve yourself in algebraic manipulation. And of course, the next question is, okay, why is algebra uh, application, application or that? And that's all right. Um, but of course, how many of us actually go into the classroom and say that the teaching of the multiplication of fractions is important because it teaches us to reason well. It teaches us to be logical. These are also applications. These are not the kind of applications that we see or we say that we can use in our daily life in the kitchen or, or in the, uh, with the Sydney Harbour Bridge. But these are applications that define who we are as a human being. These are the mindsets that we learn as we become a citizen of the new century to navigate the, the, um, the, the demands of life. Uh, how many of us do actually say that? Now, uh, one of the things that I, I, I'm very, very uh, amazed when I visit schools in, 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 in Asia and visit mass classrooms elsewhere is this difference. Very often in many schools in Asia, students also ask the question, why are we learning this? But also, I'm seeing more incidents in Asia where the teachers are saying, this is important because it teaches you problem solving. It teaches you to be logical. It teaches you to be, um, to be, to be more fluent. Now, these are the words that are the maths proficiencies. Linking this to the why are we learning this might be a way to go. Um, something for you to think about. Um, and going beyond Pi Day, there's also Fibonacci Day, 23rd of November coming up. Um, uh, a lot of opportunities there. But relating Fibonacci to the things that you see in real life. And, and, and it's not just about, oh, uh, because Mona Lisa is full of golden rectangles. Uh, yeah, golden rectangles. Um, and that defines beauty. But it is not, it is beyond that. Um, talk about how cosmetic surgeons in Korea make use of that as well. If you're going to go under the knife to have your face done up in Korea. <laughs> but be careful when you go in, when you come out, your passport will show your face, facial recognition. <laughs> it will be a problem when you come back into customs again. Uh, but the application of Fibonacci um, uh, the golden rectangle, the golden ratio in, in natural phenomenon, cyclones, um, the Milky Way, um, and of course um, um, the, the ways in which uh, nature, flowers and branches uh, distribute themselves as well. So, and of course, um, there are other things you can make use of when we talk about ceremonies. Um, what about that time of the month? I mean, I'm talking about... <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about the first Tuesday of the month, when the Reserve Bank of Australia will make a, a decision that will impact a lot on, on house owners, and, and of course there's a ripple effect, but using this as an opportunity to talk about percentages, to talk about um, rates, to talk about, um, of, of course, uh, how it relates to the four proficiencies will be useful. Um, I will very quickly talk about stories. Um, 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 uh, very often we forget that in maths and in the teaching of maths, you know, maths lessons, there is a space for stories. There's a space for even show and tell with maths focus. There's a space for us to talk about our experiences um, with, uh, with, um, with, uh, <laughs> with our, I mean ourselves as learners. And of course, of course, the resources. How many of your children's parents are involved in jobs which require lots of maths. Bringing them in as the special guests for show and tell today in our maths lesson today can be equally useful as well. Um, going along, going along, I'll just simply say that um, you know, a lot of us say Google is a happy place to work in, Facebook is a happy place to work in, but why? I mean, that is a symbol for what? Um, it is not, you know, I, I know Google, uh, every Google campus around the world serves free food, buffet style. You can have breakfast, lunch, dinner, supper in Google, in your workplace. And even as a guest as well. So if you have a friend working in Google, just go in Sydney. You have free food. Why do they do that? Now, they do that because it reflects one of the values of the, of the, of the organization. Um, so, the, oh no, no, okay, free food. Um, but in this book, Work Rules, um, an ex-employee of Google actually mentioned one of the reasons, in fact, the main reason why free food is served in Google is because the company values collaboration and communication. As we know, in a staff room, all the math teachers are sitting together, perhaps, or, or in a primary school setting, all the people who are interested in math sit together, all the people interested in language sit together. Now, Google, what Google does is that they put in micro-kitchen between these groups of people. 
so that they are forced to come together to make the coffee or to talk, um, to, to eat or to have a snack, and it gives them an opportunity to engage in com communication. A lot of bright ideas are formed during these water cooler talks. Really, really. So again, how does that uh, play out in your school setting as well? So um, um, I shall, I should stop here. Um, I should stop here, but I, 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 I had intended to have this activity, but um, I just want to end by saying that um, the sort of things that I talk about today, um, I see resonance of them in some of the other workshops. So if you happen to be in these workshops as well, think about what I say and think about how that relates to those sessions. Now, obviously, not all the workshops are, are here because this is not a conference on, on cultural um, leadership. So there are other aspects of leadership that um, this event uh, today will address, but I believe that at least these five workshops will have some resonance with cultural leadership as well. So I'll end here for questions and comments from anyone. Thank you. Thanks, Lee <laughs> Tiong. That was um, 